very strong um, track record of uh, supporting award-winning uh, reporting projects and documentary films related to climate change. We have an ongoing um, nationwide coastal climate initiative called Connected Coastlines, um, which is supported by the Howard Hughes Department of Science Education and the One Earth Fund. If you're a journalist interested in reporting on uh, coastlines, please consider uh, applying to that. That project's been ongoing for a couple years now. We've um, generated over 150 stories with um, all types of journalists, um, different formats um, for U.S. local news outlets in just, just a couple years. The, um, just this past spring, um, we launched this exciting new uh, climate initiative that we are calling Your Work Environment. Um, this will explore the ever-evolving nexus of climate risks and labor. Um, the initiative is open now, so if you're a journalist and you're looking for grants to report um, on this, this uh, issue area, um, you can go uh, read more about it and apply on our website. Um, the most common uh, climate coverage uh, these days really tends to focus on the extreme, even dystopian um, aspects of the issue, the hurricanes, the wildfires, um, increasing coastal floods. Um, according to the uh, ILO, in the coming decades, fully a third of the global workforce will be affected by climate-induced risks, and including um, mostly heat. Um, temperatures exceeding 39 degrees Celsius, if you're um, working in that condition for uh, a long, any uh, length of, of time, can kill. Um, and there are even, um, uh, but even when there are no fatalities, such temperatures can leave many people unable to work or uh, able to work only at a reduced rate. Um, some groups of workers are, are more vulnerable than others. Uh, older workers, for example, have lower physiological resistance to high levels of heat, um, yet they, they are increasingly representing a larger part of the workforce um, due to um, kind of natural consequences of public aging. The ILO also reports that the accumulated financial loss due to heat stress is expected to reach 2.4 trillion U.S. dollars uh, by 2030. So just a sort of staggering amount of kind of uh, economic uh, loss and financial loss. Um, is, is no, if nothing is done now to mitigate climate change, uh, these costs will be much higher as global temperatures increase uh, even further towards the end of, end of this century. We think this new initiative, with its focus on climate and work risks, will help alter the way we all think about and report on climate change. This multi-year global reporting and education initiative seeks to explore how climate risks are playing out in the fields, on the facti factory floors, and being discussed in company boardrooms. As the world heats up, what jobs and employment sectors, what factory practices, what sorts of manufacturing, from computer chips to batteries to food production um, to even fast fashion, are threatened most by climate change? Um, we're very grateful to the Loudest Foundation for their support of our work on the intersection of climate and labor, to the Norwegian Inter International Climate and Forest Initiative for our work on tropical forests, and the many individual donors and foundations who support our work more broadly. In just a moment, we'll uh, have a conversation with our, our panelists here. But first, a couple housekeeping tips. Uh, please use the hashtag interconnected22 to join the conversation with fellow attendees and follow along with conference insights and activities. And uh, one more reminder that uh, as long as you're in the room, um, be mindful of each other's safety and please keep your masks on um, at, at all times. And with that, we'll get started. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce our guests here. With us today are uh, Elijah Wolfson, Time Magazine's editorial director responsible for climate coverage, Hannah Fairfield, uh, the climate editor for the New York Times, Bangladeshi environmental lawyer and activist Rizwana San, and Jessica Bryce, senior editor for Latin America at Bloomberg News and a fellow with the Pulitzer Center's Rainforest Investigations Network. Thank you all for taking the time to come here today. Really appreciate it and looking forward to the conversation. Um, perhaps we'll start off with the person who traveled the farthest to get here today, and um, uh, that would be uh, Rizwana. Um, she's a courageous environmental lawyer, an activist who has led numerous l successful legal and social campaigns protecting locals' traditional livelihoods, uh, and agricultural and forest rights, and fighting against illegal uh, filling up of wetlands uh, by for-profit entities, uh, environmental aggressions, pollution, among other issues. She's the chief executive of the Bangladeshi Environmental Lawyers Association and um, was named one of the 40 environmental heroes 
uh, of the World by Time Magazine. She's also received the Goldman Environmental Prize, the Tang Prize, the International Women of Courage Award for 2022, just to name a few. Uh, Rizwana, thank you for joining us today. Um, I thought maybe uh, you could um, start off by just giving us a little sense of your background and 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 labor uh, activism and and um, and law and how that's sort of been intertwined with climate. Okay. Uh Thank you very much. I'm actually an environmental uh, justice advocate, so the kind of advocates who do not necessarily get other clients who can pay them. So my clients are people who can't pay them, and actually I'm the fit lawyer for them. Uh, I mean, that, that's what I have uh, mastered. So as an environmental justice advocate, I work to, I work to ensure conducive work environment for People. So it's not only natural environment that I work on, I work on work environment as well. So this has taken me to dirty industries like coal-based power plant, to ship breaking, to tanneries, uh, to ready-made garments, which is not very dirty, but it has its darker side in our part of the world. Uh, when you talk about environmental justice, you talk about access to resources, you talk about people who earn their living from natural resource bases. So they may not strictly fall within the definition of labor under the Labor Act, but they are the ones who uh, form the most part of the labor force in Bangladesh. So I work more closely with the informal labor mm -hmm. uh, laborers, like the fisher folk, uh, the forest dependent, tribal communities, the farmers. And we have 17 million fisher folk families who are affected by climate change. So anything in Bangladesh is in millions. We have got 16 million farmers who are uh, being impacted by the negative consequences of uh, climate change. When I work with shipwrecking, I work with the construction industry, I work with the tannery industry, I work more for ensuring personal protective devices, having health monitoring system in place, those sort of things. And the challenges for my regular work as an environmental justice advocate is increasing due to the threats of the climate change. And you know, being from a country where people who are uh, kind of least responsible for global warming are bearing the brunt, of the effects, um, you know, how is the issue of climate change uh, and work um, risks viewed by people on the ground, uh, the people you work with? Uh, that's an interesting question because I came when the last session was going on and I heard one of the participants say, one of the panelists saying that it's not that they don't talk about climate change, they just do it in a different language. So yes, farmers don't know about IPCC. Uh, they don't know about the various reactive missions, missions the, very, uh, the UN agencies are sending to your countries. But they are the ones who can give you the first-hand information about why life is changing for them, why they are not getting water. They are having, like we have one southwest region in Bangladesh. In last 15 years, we had seven major tidal surges there and people are migrating from those areas. So they don't speak our language when they talk about climate change, but they know that their water has become salinated. They know that their crop production has gone down. They know that they can't catch fish anymore. They know that they can't live in this area. They have to move elsewhere to earn a living. So they are not the informal labor market, but then definitely the workers, the laborers, who are feeling all the impacts of climate change, but they just don't understand the signs of climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, wondering um, how, uh, you know, you view or, or, or would characterize international media coverage uh, of this topic up until this point, um, you know, what, what is missing uh, in your view from international media coverage of climate uh, issues in, in your country? When media reports, they talk about how many cyclones have taken place in Bangladesh, which flood was more devastating. But they do not necessarily 
keep on elaborating on the impact of these disasters on people's livelihood, particularly the impact of these disasters on the livelihood of the traditional livelihood earners. Uh, the other thing that I find uh, media saying a lot is about the developed countries' responsibilities to pay the developing countries. So they talk about loss and damage also. But I wonder, even in an ideal world, you have a loss and damage uh, mechanism, which is very accessible. What will the fishermen of Shatkira, who is, which is in the southwest region of Bangladesh, do, given the fact that he actually can't live in his area anymore? He perhaps can't live in his country anymore. He probably has to leave the country and settle elsewhere. So the media talks about money, but making it accessible to poor, or pr how to prioritize that, uh, this, they talk about it, but listening from the grassroots people, they don't say that. They say it you know, following the discussions that the civil societies may have. Uh, I remember in, in the Khulna region of Bangladesh that is faced with frequent uh, tidal surges, all the international media covered it, but it was more a one-shot thing. What happened afterwards? The area is being regularly inundated because the embankments breached. So there is you know, this tidal surge every day that's happening. So that follow-up, I often miss. And it's also important to talk about the transparency. I just read a newspaper article this morning that the Bangladeshi government is thinking of uh, investing $80 billion uh, dollars for, climate, for ad climate change adaptation. But the question is, yes, you get the money. But is the money reaching the people? What is the mechanism that you have in place to ensure that when the United States gives me the money, I have the mechanism in place through which I'll be able to prioritize uh, wisely and ensure that the money is reaching to the farmers and the fishermen? Thank you for that. Um, um, Bangladesh is probably one of the countries um, hardest hit by climate change and yeah. internally causes a lot of migration. I'm just wondering what have you seen in terms of the connection between that migration and labor? Yeah, I oh, have opened up my um, computer because I wanted to give you some figures. See, up to 2019, Bangladesh was seventh among countries worst affected by climate change. And in 1960, the number of rural population was 96. It is now 62.5, which means that there has been huge migration from the rural areas to the city areas where people feel more protected and they seem to you know, have the reliance that we'll be able to get some sort of a livelihood there. Uh, it is being predicted by UN that by 2050, at least, at least 13.3 million Bangladeshis could be forced to migrate. And Bangladesh is the eighth most populated country of the world. We, we don't have the landmass to accommodate this one third, the, the people that will be coming from this one third landmass that will go underwater. So we are already seeing inflow of migration taking place at an alarming scale. But in terms of uh, these people moving to the cities and urban areas, peri-urban areas, and getting involved in various uh, industries, um, how do you see sort of r these um, alarming rates of future heat affecting these, these workers? They are not really getting employment in formal sector uh, because they do not have the skill, uh, the, the capacity to get employment in the formal sector mm -hmm. immediately. Because of all the inflows of rural population to the main city, the capital of Dhaka is the worst livable city of the world. And in one square kilometer, we have 48,000 people living. I mean, we are still surviving. That's, that's, a, that's a success in itself. But the thing is, they are getting risky jobs. They're becoming rickshaw pullers. They're getting into construction industry. And every month, you will hear one uh, report that some one worker uh, working in a high-rise building, doing some painting or some plastering, has fallen from the height and has died. And these people who are losing everything in the rural areas, there is no social protection mechanism, Bangladesh being a very poor country. 
So they are coming to the cities, not because they love to live in the cities, but it's compulsion. That is where the justice mm. issue comes into effect. I must say one thing, that in most vulnerable countries, it is very common, with or without climate change, that the life of the laborers will not be easy. They'll be in, they will be involved in risky uh, ventures. They will not have adequate protection at the workplace. With climate change being an additional challenge, the risk increases manifold. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're going to track from, from Bangladesh over to Brazil. Um, I'm going to introduce Jessica Bryce, uh, senior editor for Latin America at Bloomberg News. She's uh, lived in Sao Paulo for 15 years. Uh, she's a member, as I mentioned earlier, of the Rainforest Investigative uh, network. Um, she's really thrown herself into a lot of amazing uh, investigations that are revealing supply chain links to consumer leather, uh, beef, and, and massive deforestation. Um, if you haven't read her work, please go to go to Bloomberg, go to our site, uh, and, and and elsewhere, New York Times, and and look it up. Um, so, uh, Jessica, um, maybe you could just give us a little more um, background in in terms of your uh, experience in. Uh, Brazil and and kind of focus on climate issues. Sure, um, I uh, spent I've spent most of my time in Brazil as as an editor, um, working across beats, so from markets to <clears throat> business, government, um, really you know uh, the financial uh, currencies and that sort of thing. Um, it's only recently that I became an investigative reporter. In the past two years, I've been uh, working with the uh, Rainforest Investigations Network. I um, am on the ground investigating. And really, that came about as I started to um, code and look at data journalism and look at uh, how uh, the data that's out there can really help inform what we're seeing in like these large nations, and especially places like uh, the rainforest in the Amazon. I mean, even most Brazilians don't spend that much time up there, never actually even go there. It's a very sort of foreign place for you know anyone who lives in Sao Paulo or Rio. It's not uncommon for them just to know nothing about the actual conditions um, on the ground. And so during that time, the past two years, I've been focusing on investigations um, with a lot of help from the, uh, the, the Rainforest Investigations Network. Um, I've been focused on um, the, uh, cattle, the, the supply of uh, ranching, or sorry, the supply of beef. 75% um, of the, am of the um, land that's carved out of the Amazon is turned into pasture. And so when we're talking about um, industries that are really changing the world, I mean, there's no sort of bigger industry in, you know, than, than Brazilian ranching. Mm. Right? Yeah, and, and, and in terms of um, other, other um, sectors of the Brazilian economy that might be impacted by um, you know, rising, dramatically rising heat and temperatures. Um, you know, what are some potential s sectors or, or even um, potential uh, stories that you see might be evolving out of Brazil related to climate and labor issues? Well, there's a little bit, I mean, when you're talking about uh, the, the big industries in um, Brazil, it's, you know, like so many developing nations, commodities is obviously the big one, right? Um, a lot of the, uh, we certainly have seen a lot more in the south of the country. We've seen a lot more drought um, over the past, I don't know, I want to say five years or so. Um, the, you know, when I first moved down there, it was impressive in that, um, you know, the, the seasonal rains, it was like someone had opened a tap in the sky. Um, and. And I personally personally am seeing some of that. Um, the The ranchers and the farmers who are going into the Amazon and grabbing all this land, they're ultimately the ones who will pay a huge price when we're talking about um, climate change and how that changes industry. Right, the the yield. I mean, in the south of Brazil, you are seeing, and certainly down into Argentina and stuff, you are seeing that um, the farmers are struggling. It's not the the land is no longer producing 
uh, as much as it used to produce. And the big irony in the, in the Amazon is that land, um, the soil itself, is actually not terribly like fertile soil. It's not very, it's not great soil for, for plants. You would think it would be because it just supports such an incredible um, uh, ecosystem. But once you tear down all those trees and you get rid of all that vegetation, that natural vegetation, um, it's really tough to make a living by, it's really tough to make that land productive. And so they're the ones who are really going to end up paying the biggest price in the industry. So they're, they're having to, to work harder f and, exactly. and uh, when, when it doesn't work out somewhere, they're driving further into the Amazon looking for... They're driving further into the Amazon or what is happening and what I've done a lot of reporting on is that, um, you know, the, the big argument for developing land in the Amazon is Brazilian poverty. Um, so you get uh, poor folks who, through various forces, various factors, have been driven into the Amazon for decades, you know, if not even more than a century, they've been told to go out and make a life out there. Um, they go, they, you know, tear down the trees. They're the ones who are committing the crimes. They go tear down the trees, and then all of a sudden they can't make it, right? Because it's the, the land's not good. It's hard to live in, you know, um, in such a vacuum with no school or systems or uh, government presence. Uh, and so they end up aban abandoning that land, and then it gets sort of sucked up into industrialized farming. And so most of that land is now is, um, you know, it could, because it needs such such investment to actually mm -hmm. make it productive, right? Mm -hmm. So it's getting funneled into the hands of a few. It's not helping the poverty uh, situation in Brazil at all. Got it, got it. And um, what would you say are some of the main challenges or barriers to um, covering uh, climate issues in, in working in Brazil? And right. I mean, I think the biggest barrier is that the Brazilians who are doing much of the damage they're not actually seeing, um, or the Brazilians who are doing all of the damage up in the Amazon, they're not necessarily seeing the effects of that damage right now, right? You fly into any one of these Amazon states and you talk to the politicians or you talk to the business owners, or you talk to the folks on the ground and they say, well, look around, look at all the trees that we have. Um, you say, well, you know, the rainfall, you're going to start getting less rain. And they say, oh, thank God, we don't want so much rain. It rains too much here. It's hard to, to farm when there's so much rain. And so you are seeing, and people do comment on the shift in uh, climate, right, the sh shift in um, weather patterns and such around the Amazon. Um, and when I say the folks living in the Amazon, I'm talking about sort of the industry that I've focused on, which is kind of on the border of the Amazon, which is the ranchers and the farmers and stuff, certainly not deep in the, I'm not talking about like the indigenous communities inside because I'm sure they'd be saying something very different, but the folks who are living around the Amazon and really pushing into the Amazon, the farmers, the ranchers, um, the families, they're saying, um, we don't believe in climate change, right? For the most part. Um, and that's, and then you have a government that is not teaching their people about the effects of climate change. And they're not teaching, um, they're not um, communicating to the folks about how terrible things can get if they don't stop this destruction of the Amazon. Mm. So I, that's really the biggest challenge that I face, is trying to talk to these groups of people um, in, in my reporting and trying to build a bridge into that in, in my stories. Got it, got it. Um, thank you. Um, Hannah Fairfield is the climate editor at the New York Times. She joined the Times in 2000 as a graphics editor and later helped lead the Times award-winning graphics department. She received two master's degrees from Columbia University and has taught data vis visualization at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. Um, projects she has worked on have won a Pulitzer, Peabody, Loeb, and Polk Awards. Um, welcome, Hannah. Thank you. Um, You've um, kind of uh, helped, uh, you know, grow the Times coverage of climate, um, you know, over the last, uh, uh, since, you, since you joined in, in, in many different ways. And I'm just wondering if you could just give us a little insight into, um, you know, what kind of approaches you all are taking at the Times in covering uh, the climate topic and what sort of stories you're looking for, that type of 
Sure. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for, for asking me here. Um, I've been the climate editor at the time since 2017, which is when the New York Times decided to establish a climate desk, which was unusual at the time to, to sort of spring to life a new news desk um, that sits right next to the national desk and the international desk um, and, um, and all the you know, business, all the news desks at, at the New York Times. So it was unusual to, to start a new one from scratch. And um, the reason to do that really is that the Times felt very strongly that this was an area that, that uh, readers needed to understand more about um, and that we uh, had the resources to be able to really build something that could meet readers' needs um, and really increase um, the sort of the, all of the knowledge um, about this. So we have, um, well, in 2017, we started with about um, 10. Uh, reporters, editors, um, visual editors, um, because obviously that's that's a great love of mine, um, and we've grown to about 20, so we've doubled our size in about five years, and we cover policy, science, economics, adaptation, investigation, like the good work that that you all do here, um, and it's been it's been uh, a, kind of a wild ride um, and really exciting. Um, we're still growing, um, very much so, and every year, I feel like. You know, we expand our coverage, we expand our knowledge, um, and we expand our readership, which is pretty great. Um, but in 2017, when I was thinking about that question, what is it that we're going to cover? We, the Times has never had a desk like this before, so, you know, what are we going to go out and do? Um, I, I kept the mission of the New York Times very much in focus, um, because part of the New York Times mission is to help people understand their world. And I thought, you know, our world's changing so dramatically. You know, here, this is an incredibly important part of the Times mission. So I really, I think about that a lot when I think about story choice, story selections. I think about how can we help people understand the world that they live in and how it's changing around them. And one of the first um, pieces that we did in 2017, um, also it was a data visualization, um, we went to the, um, the excellent um, Yale um, uh, uh, School of Climate Communication and looked at their data about how Americans in particular, how they think about climate change. And I thought their data was very interesting. We made um, a, a, a two maps out of that. And one of them was an interesting polling question that said, do you think that um, climate change is happening around you? And, um, and the answer almost exclusively was in all county in the United States, the answer was yes, climate change is definitely happening. The second question was, is climate change affecting you personally? And the answer almost exclusively was no. So I got a sense right away that people thought this was happening, but they really didn't think that it applied to them. And I thought, well, that seems like a pretty good place to start, right? If people don't think this is happening to them, but the science is very clear that it is, then we have a really important job to do. And because of that, we started doing um, a, a lot of interesting reporting, um, not just on coastal cities, although I think that's incredibly important, but, but one of the, the coastal packages that we did was we looked at San Francisco and Manila, two cities not unsimilar in size across a huge ocean from each other, both very vulnerable to sea level rise in very different economic situations. And what did climate change look like to both of those cities? Um, but all cities, it's not just coastal cities. So we also last year did a, a really interesting project on Chicago, landlocked. You wouldn't think that Chicago would be a particularly climate vulnerable city, but it is because it's right on a lake. And that lake has high evaporation and it also has high levels of flooding, much more so than the city was ever built to actually endure. So, so Chicago was basically engineered to work with a three feet sort of swing high in the water and a three feet swing low in the water. So you've got kind of six feet to work with on engineering. We're starting to see swings in the, in the vein of six feet up, six feet down. So you're doubling basically the threat to, to engineering. Um, and that was pretty fascinating, again, because there was a, a bit of a surprise factor um, to Chicago. Um, Another one, actually, we just published um, earlier this week was on the Great Salt Lake um, drying up and how the pollution that is in that lake is really making the air um, toxic and almost unlivable. We've, we have talked a lot um, at this conference about sort of, of um, you know, 
areas that you can no longer live, and, and a lot of them is because of land subsidence, but it, it, it also can be because of pollution, um, and I think that that's a really Im Im important piece of the puzzle as well. Um, so those are kind of the, the that's kind of the, where I start, basically. And, you know, you mentioned all the different lenses you look at climate issues through the economic, political, and um, business, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, how do you see the relevance of kind of labor and worker uh, issues in climate um, coverage? I think it's incredibly important, um, and, in, and I can talk about it both, um, both domestically and, and internationally. Um, one of the things I was very curious about a few years ago um, was, was power. Um, where does the electricity actually come from in different states across the country, right? Because it's not the same in every state. And so we took a look at that data and, and we built um, we built a piece that answers that question, where does your state make electricity? And we looked at it over time. And it's fascinating. So 20 years ago, Pennsylvania got most of its, of its energy from coal, but now it doesn't. Um, now it gets most of it from natural gas. So in that change, you're definitely going to see a labor change. Um, Iowa now has 40% of its electricity come from wind. And that's been a huge change in just the, pa the past 10 years. Um, Nevada was 50% coal 20 years ago. Now it's only 7% coal. And it's 14% solar. So if you think about those kind of changes in just what powers our lights, and you can think about what's behind that, and what's behind that is, is labor in many, many ways. And we're really seeing you know, major, major changes um, in that kind of, of you know, labor supply and demand in the United States. Um, and so in many ways, I, you know, I wanted to continue to explore that. Um, and so we've done stories about how um, parents and grandparents who worked in coal, but the grandchildren work in solar. Um, in really interesting and fascinating ways. And, and to sort of see the, that generational story um, when people aren't moving, but their world is changing around them um, and, their, um, and their labor, um, you know, basically what's available to them um, in labor is, is really different. Um, and internationally, it's, um, it's, it's a, an obviously an, an incredibly important story. I, I thought a lot about this, um, especially in, in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we, we did a series of stories called Inequality at Boiling Point. Um, and it was hard because we couldn't travel, right? My reporters want to go out. Um, they want to see um, the workers. They want to talk to them. And in, in 2020, we were just not able to travel. Um, but we weren't going to let that stop us. So what we did was um, I wanted to do a very visual piece to show how people across the world, how workers in particular, were experiencing extreme heat. And so we paired with local photographers yeah. on the ground, and we really had them be our eyes, took extensive notes. Samini Sengupta, um, my international climate correspondent, um, she spent hours and hours on the phone with them just seeing what they saw. And then they sent hundreds and hundreds of photographs back so that we could see what they saw. It was a very different kind of reporting, um, but it was what we could do at the time. And I was really, um, really happy with, with what we were able to give to readers. Um, so we were able to see um, workers in Guatemala and in India and Nigeria and Greece and in the US. Um, we, went to, uh, we looked at Houston and also in New York City. Um, and we really looked at people. Most of them worked outside um, construction. There was a, a construction worker in India, um, farmer in Guatemala. Um, and, and to see how they were working earlier hours um, and really struggling in, in, um, in the past you know, recent years, um, it's, it's really been very, very dramatic. And so that, that's something that I felt like we could provide to our readers um, a window into, into how important and how dramatic that, that really is.
Great. Thank you. I, I want to come back to you and, and ask you questions about how we, we um, you know, form more collaborations with journalists in, in other countries. That was a great example. Um, and I'm going to move on real quickly to uh, Elijah Wolfson. Uh, he's an award-winning multimedia journalist uh, currently working at Time Magazine as an editorial director responsible for the publications Climate Change and Health Coverage. He previously worked at Quartz at Newsweek. He has contributed to uh, The Atlantic, Al Jazeera America, and Vice, and has appeared as a commentator on BBC, MS, NBC, NBC, and others. Um, Elijah, maybe you could welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'd love to for you to give us some insights in kind of what your your um, you know approach has been at time um, when you're uh, you know looking at uh, climate issues. Um, how, what are you doing to deal with maybe um, climate fatigue with uh, readers? And um, yeah, I'll just. Let you let you go from there. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I I would say um, uh, just the the like quick history of Times climate coverage, at least recently. Um, obviously, you know, publications been around a long time. There's some history there. Um, we've done some major climate stuff um, in the in the decades before I was born. Um, but uh, recently, when I joined, we we had we didn't have a climate team. We had one uh, climate reporter who worked out of the DC bureau. Um, we've established a climate team now um, that has, uh, I think, five or six journalists, and we're growing it. Um, it's become the, 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 the issue, really, um, across the board for our team. Um, for the entire editorial team, uh, we've you know we've taken the approach sort of like our internal mantra and our external um, branding has been uh, that climate is everything, and so that's the approach we take. It's like what what how does climate um, impact every single thing that cuts across all the stuff that we that we cover that we feel is important: politics, culture, society labor, um, health, uh, really everything. Um, so, I mean, in terms of climate fatigue, I, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's something I, I think about pretty regularly. I mean, I, I was actually just um, chatting with um, uh, a friend and a guy I've worked with in the past, Adam Met. He's a um, musician, but also a PhD in, um, I forget exactly, something some something relevant to climate, but he's um, he, he's a really really sharp guy, um, and we were just talking about this that that exact issue. Um, how, how do you how do you get beyond that? I think some of it is about um, uh, the um, I forget who brought it up. I, I mean, really, you guys covered a lot of the bases. So, <laughs> um, uh, but but just the um, you know bringing it into the personal. Uh, as much as you can. And that's like, really, I struggle with it a lot because um, the truth be told, like it, 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 there is nothing that any one individual can really do to solve this problem. And I think that's the big challenge. It's like a gigantic existential issue. Um, and it's really hard to look at that in the face, um, look at it in the face when you, you like can't really do anything as an individual. So, but how do you make it feel real to people? Um, it, yeah, were you talking about like? Yeah, I think you were talking about um, Brazilians like seeing the effects, but not really like understanding it. It's climate, right? Um, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it was you. Sorry, um, <laughs> but but anyway, the, the the point is like I think um, I don't know. I mean, part of it is helping draw those connections, like like making talking about it in a language that. Um, uh, is more um, grounded and, and less like in the um, ivory towers of academia and um, you know uh, NGOs and think tanks and stuff. Um, are you are you yeah. finding it's a challenge to get journalists to operate that way to you know get out of the you know obviously interview the scientists and and politicians and others but to get out of that mindset and go find and, and, and listen to voices of people who are impacted and how they are understanding or grappling with 
climate. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think no. I think I think journalists want to do it. Um, the ones I work with, I think they want to to be able to do that. I think that it's um, there isn't. I, I don't know if there's like a clear solution. You know, um, I, I think one of the um, one of the issues is that it all feels so like um, dispersed, right? Especially here and. I'm uh, because I work for Time. Our audience, you know, it's basically the global English-speaking community, um, which generally is, you know, um, primarily we're, we're we're looking at like the UK and the US. Um, really, that, that's our audience, and um, I mean, the, essentially, these are places that outsource all of their climate destruction, right? Um, and, and especially when it comes to the labor, you know, to, to bring it back to what, you know, we're, we're talking about today, um, especially when it comes to the labor aspect of it and who's impacted, um, you know, the, 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 the climate impacts of the things that, um, you know, are on sale for us in the U.S. Um, are, are totally invisible. Um, and so it's really hard to, like, <laughs> make those connections without it becoming this whole like Byzantine um, difficult to uh, absorb and oftentimes like frankly like not that resonant <laughs> type of reporting because it requires all of that sort of you know documentation and oftentimes it's, it's just non-existent um, and even when you can get it, it 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 can be really hard to make it feel grounded Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I, sure. it's just, I, th these are sort of like the things that I've been struggling with or sure. working through. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I would like to just let everyone know there, there are two uh, microphones right here. So if you have questions you would like to ask um, any of our panelists, please feel free to step up to the microphone and, and um, let us have a, have a question. Um, yes, go ahead. Hi, Steve. Hi, Alice. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name's Alice Glenn, and I just have a quick question that um, I was noticing there's a lot of, I mean, obvious negative effects, economic effects of climate change, but do you see or recognize any positive economic impacts in um, any of your area of expertise? Thank you. Positive impacts from the changing climate, you mean? Positive economic. Impacts from the changing climate. I, I mean, I don't think this is directly because of um, the changing climate, but certainly, you know, th there's this debate, you know, of you look at Brazil and in the Amazon region, there's 23 million people living there. Um, and there's, you know, you ask yourself, and politicians are asking themselves, and even, you know, environmentalists in the region and everything, they ask themselves, you know, what's worse for them? Uh, like, what's worse for your health, really? Like, poverty or pollution, right? Um, poverty or, you know, the climate change that's really far off, right? And so development, the you know as this land gets turned into farmland the gdp rises in those areas and that's a really hard force to combat right like that's a, just a really hard driver to fight you know um and i think um you know uh you know, so it's not necessarily that climate change is changing the economic. There is positive economic forces there, but certainly, you know, the Brazilians and a lot of Brazilians see that as as a positive move forward. And I think, um, you know, the the causes are so complex, but the solutions, I think, we need to start thinking a little bit slightly differently, as well. Um, there's no sort of market forces that drive. Um, gains in people's lives in the same way that development does, mm. right? 
So there's no saving the environment and saving the rainforest that drives those similar gains that people look at and say, I'm looking at a better life. Uh, in Brazil, where we, you know, I'm talking obviously about that specifically, but if there was some, you know, market forces, uh, there's there's some solutions out there, right? Like carbon credits, are, carbon credits are being studied. Um, you know, ranchers are telling me they want a premium on on truly green beef. Um, but the world needs to sort of value the standing forest the same way that it values the a torn down forest. Thank you. I, just go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I have two thoughts to add to this. One is, um, I I think this again goes back to this idea of um, you know wealthier countries essentially outsourcing the right. it, the 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 cost to poor countries because it's like the U.S. just destroyed most of its forests. And then was like, "Hey, Brazil, don't <laughs> cut down yours." Um, and I think there's a, I, I think it's Nauru. I forget. I, I'm forgetting which um, island nation state it is. But um, essentially, you know, they had been. Um, there, there's sort of this whole debate going on there right now. The the current president um, wants to um, reduce its marine protected area, which is currently at like 90 percent of its um, territorial. Uh, you know the the ocean territory that it owns um, down to uh, it's either thirty or forty percent, basically in line with what the global goal is, right? But their argument is is like why should we, you know, a country that has not really contributed anything to emissions be protecting ninety percent when you know the U.S. is only protecting ten percent of theirs? Um, and it's a totally reasonable argument, and it is based on this economic thing where it's like. They need that. They, they that's an economic value for them to be able to fish in those areas. Um, so, so that's a piece of it. I think that there's also um, this is a, a on a sort of a little bit more of a micro scale thing because this is really primarily a U.S. thing that is what I know about. But um, it definitely is the case in the U.S. that there's a lot of economic opportunity with green energy and green tech development. I mean, the money going into it is massive. Um, there are some really interesting projects like the big wind farm off of Martha's Vineyard. Um, they're you know doing things like creating bespoke training um, programs for people in that region to like get you know basically get free um, leveling up on tech. Education. Um, my colleague Justin Warland wrote uh, not too long ago about um, uh, a town in the Midwest. Again, I'm forgetting the specifics, but it's a town in the Midwest that is like you know very traditional, sort of like you know uh, you know big you know Detroit three manufacturing town, car manufacturing, um, where uh, things got shut down and they are. But now there's a electric vehicle company manufacturing um, facility that's being built and they're doing similar things where they're training these people up and um, and and so there, there there is definitely some opportunity there um, but I don't think it's it's as clean as like yes this is going to be beneficial to everybody there's going to be people who there are going there will be winners and losers I guess yeah and uh uh, Rizwana, it looks like. Alice, I think the answer of the question would depend on which development narrative you believe in. Uh, if you tell uh, any corrupt government of one of the most vulnerable countries about whether they're having um, you know, positive economic impact, they'll say, yes, yes, yes. Because we'll get fund from the you know, donors, the developed countries, and we'll have more to plunder with. Uh, Insurance companies are very happy because new business will come their way. Uh, forest that was being protected by the forest dependent communities without ever receiving any money. Uh, that, mod devil that management model is changing. You're going there with your carbon trading and uh, mitigation target. So now you're telling them, to, we'll pay them, please protect it. But this is something they have been doing for years, no? for centuries, without money being paid. False solutions are being offered. Uh, 
so your traditional seed does not yield much. So go for my company's hybrid or genetically modified seeds. So new markets are being created for new players, and I'm sure some of them will uh, see some positive sides to it. But me being a perennial uh, negative thinker, <laughs> even I would also say that the climate climate change has put the whole development model into question. If we can capitalize on that, then there will be real sustainable economic development. Because climate change is teaching us to protect our coastal forests. Climate change is, is teaching us to preserve our own seeds. Climate change is um, telling us that you can't afford to have uh, coal, you have to switch to renewable. So I take the agenda of green economy with a bit of a question mark, because it does not address all the justice issues that climate change uh, poses. But I think if you really uh, can increase your conservation effort, if you can go for uh, massive afforestation, renewable energy, preservation of local seeds, um, respecting cultural knowledge, utilizing cultural knowledge, those things will bring a model of development which I believe will be really sustainable. So the whole economics uh, have to be uh, think in a different dimension. Thank you, Rosanna. Take another question from the audience. Hi. Um, following up actually on the discussion just now, um, I have an observation, and then I would like to get um, your responses to it. Um, listening to to the panelists, you know, I was really struck about um, as a journalist who writes for an American audience, you know, white female privileged. If I were to go to somewhere to try to interview um, Brazilian ranch farmers or Indonesian um, palm oil. Uh, plantation owners and be like, stop this, you're going to, or write a story saying, this is against your own interests, you know, you should stop. I mean, the accusations of lack of legitimacy on my part and hypocrisy all the way to the end because it's an American, you know, I have profited from, you know, my country's own exploitation of its resources and abuse of indigenous peoples and slavery. So how do you over, how do journalists with a background like myself who are writing primarily for a Western audience deal with, I think, that very powerful attack on, on legitimacy and accusations of hypocrisy because, yes, it's a journalism argument, but it's also a, a communication problem. Like, it's communi journalists are journalists, but we're also communicators. And, and we've got to deal with and grapple with, you know, where different people are coming from and how they see air issues of right and wrong and justice. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to, to take that one. Um, I think that, I mean, first and foremost, um, I think that you and we all report with incredible empathy. Um, the story that I described about um, inequality at the boiling point, that was a story that because we worked so closely with the photographers who were, who were, they were the community that they were reporting on. Um, and we listened, we spent so much time with them listening and seeing what they saw. And I think that there are ways to do that for many stories, if not all stories. Um, and another thing that, that, that we can do as an institution, not you personally, but we can do as an institution is to create the partnerships that, that Steve was talking about. Um, uh, last year, um, we also were, were very interested in um, deforestation in Brazil connected to the, the leather industry. Um, and we partnered with the Rainforest Investigations Network, the Times and, and the Rainforest Investigations Network, and worked with Manuela Andriani, who is in the back. <laughs> um, and she was there on the ground. Um, and she was, you know, in many ways part of that community. And, and I felt um, that she was our, 
She was our liaison. She was our way to understand this community. She was, she was, we were reporting with empathy, but we went one step further to make sure that we were working with somebody who was part of that community so we could really understand it um, instead of bringing, bringing our own outside thoughts or judgments um, to really put those aside um, and, and first understand really what's going on in the community and how we can best reflect that to our readers. I think just being, I think that there's a, there's a risk of turning um, some of the bad actors on the ground into sort of black and white villains. Um, and I think even, you know, that extends to some of the politicians who may not be a favorite in this room, even when you're talking about Bolsonaro, right? He says, absolutely, uh, when it comes to the environment, he has been very destructive. Yet there's a huge swath of Brazil that really, really supports him. And so just asking the question, well, why, right? What is it that drives these people out into the forest and putting yourself in those shoes to tr really try to connect the human story there to the human story of your readers, right? Um, and acknowledging the demand side of the equation. Um, and by that I mean like the, you know, all of these commodities are heading to industrialized nations. And I don't think we're, because it's so hard to connect the dots to those supply chains, I don't think that um, people are, you know, making that connection enough. Like they're really, really focusing on this idea that like, you buy a cell phone and it could have illegal gold from the Amazon in it. Um, or you're, you know, you're buying beef um, and it's very likely connected to Amazon deforestation. Um, and so I think just maybe finding a little bit more balance in some of that reporting and trying to at least acknowledge the why of that these guys are, you know, why are they going into the forest and what would I do in their situation? What would anyone do in their situation? Um, I think goes a long way. Uh, I am an American and I have, you know, I do go up into that, into the, those, those regions and do a lot of that reporting. Um, and, and that's how I've, you know, really been able to tell the story in, in a way that I think respects both the Brazilian local point of view, but also talks to international audiences. Really, really great perspective. And Augustine? Hello, uh, my name is uh, Agostino Petroni, and I'm a, a freelance journalist from Italy. And uh, I wanted to ask you something about uh, um, how you do you select stories and how, what you're looking into the stories that are pitched to you. There are lots of freelance journalists here coming from all around the world, and it will be really interesting to uh, get some insights from you, from what you're looking for. For example, I don't know, in a region of like the Mediterranean or like Latin America, what uh, uh, does really stand out to you uh, as a story that will be published in one of your magazines and papers? Uh, in a while. <laughs> sure. Um, so, well, uh, I, I have uh, two heuristics for um, for for a good story. Um, one is, um, would you talk about it at a bar with your friends or at a dinner party, whatever? Right? Like, would you actually bring it up? Would you talk about it? How would you talk about it? Um, and and the other one is. Um, uh, essentially, like, is this moving the conversation forward in a meaningful way? Um, so, so like, not. It, I mean, everything has been written about in some way, but um, I. And so, to find something like brand new under the sun, it happens, but that's like a one in a million, right? Um, but there are many valuable ways to um, move the conversation forward um, uh, meaningfully, whether that's like adding new facts or um, making some connections. And it can be, um, you know, factually factually do, doing that through facts, but it can also be doing that through um, ideas, you know, by making new connections and things like that. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's really hard to say because it's such a sort of specific thing. That those are very broad things. I, that I'm not. I don't know if I'm telling you anything that you probably don't. I mean, you probably understand that intuitively already. Um, beyond that, I I don't know because yeah, it's it's really it, it's so specific ultimately. Um, I mean, for time specifically because it's a global. Um, publication that's like pretty broad like it's about as broad an audience you as you can get right um i you know it it sort of has to have international resonance right even if it's a local story which I, local stories are great um if but for us you know it, it has to also make connections to some broader theme that's gonna um uh yeah resonate with with that with a more international reader. Um, I would say that I often, ag again, come back to, to the mission that I always keep in mind, which is helping people to understand the world around them. And that means, to me, that there is often an element of surprise or um, une unexpectedness. I have learned something new. I understand something in a way that I didn't either understand it before or didn't didn't even know to ask questions about it. So so for me there there is is often something that that can be either revelatory or uncovered, not necessarily always investigative journalism. But I leave a story or I leave a story pitch having learned something that I didn't know before. And that is a high bar, but in many ways it should be. Um, because I think what we don't want are readers who feel like they read the same stories all the time. Um, because I don't think that, that a drumbeat is really helping us as journalists um, or is really helping to lift the knowledge base. And so I would say if you're surprised by the story that you are pitching, that is a really good first step. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just a a better way of saying what I was saying, essentially, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah, something you're ex you, you you're excited about enough to like tell people about because it's surprising and interesting and is not the same thing that everybody's heard over and over again. Yeah. Great, thank you. Next next question. Hi guys, um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm Jerry Flynn. I'm a journalist with Mongo Bay, I'm based in Cambodia. I'm also a Rin fellow as well with Jessica. Um, and I guess, you know, at this conference we've been talking a lot about impact and, you know, how to generate sort of more impactful stories. And, you know, I think in, with Cambodia, um, in terms of climate change and labor, you know, we've got the garment sector, which you know, is huge, not just in Cambodia, across South and Southeast Asia. And I mean, as a freelancer, I've covered this from the angle of human and labor rights abuses, from the angle of lost productivity, you know, when workers are collapsing in the heat or the factories flood. Um, and even going sort of after that, you know, the, the international brands to sort of say, well, look, you are the, this is within your supply chain. And so I just, I guess I wanted to get an idea from you, which kind of stories, is, is, is there like someone to sort of frame in the story to generate the most impact? Because obviously we've, I mean, Hunsen's in his 38th year of power now, so we're not seeing a lot of change on that front. So I just, I just wanted to get your ideas on, like, you know, how to make these stories change things. I mean, yeah, if you pin something on Nike, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the difficulty. I mean, I, I like I've been obsessed with supply chains for a long time. I'm totally with you, and yeah, reiterating what other people have said, but. It's really obviously it's really hard to actually pin something on any of these companies. There's so much, there's so many layers of plausible deniability um, that it makes it really tough. But yeah, I mean that that's the big story, right? If you can make it stick, um, I don't know. Sorry, that's a little flip, I know, but um, I, I think in how how you tell stories, and by how I mean like the the medium in which you're releasing your story is probably more important than ever because of this issue of climate fatigue. We've all sort of read the same stories over and over again. And so and it's not an easy thing, especially for smaller news organizations. But as much as you can, you know, getting people excited online about your stories uh, in social um, 
trying to find ways and you know to release it so that it's not just kind of like the old um, here's a you know long form print story that I'm kind of sending out into a black hole that is you know global information um, but doing you know whether it's I mean, it's it's a hard it's a hard answer, and I think even the really really big news organizations struggle with this. Of you know, how do you release it, and how do you get people excited by it, and how do you get people to be able to consume it on mobile as well as you know on their desktops and that sort of thing? Um, they struggle with, but uh, I've noticed in my um, stories and certainly Bloomberg's stories that you know we've been publishing is like sort of the broader we can get with maybe having different ways in which one story is released, um, it certainly um, amplifies the impact. And I think it also sort of, it makes all that work we put into a story um, that much more, more worthwhile because you can tell, you can it's the same reporting and maybe you're just breaking it up into a few different uh, news products to tell it in a slightly different way to a slightly different audience, right? I, I would also um, I would also come back to the word in interconnectedness, which seems to be coming up a lot today. Um, and I'll go back to the to the deforestation story that that we did on Brazil on leather. What intrigued me about that particular story and that particular story pitch was the fact that it was the we were able to to connect it to the leather in American SUVs, and that to me hit a consumer in a way that was very very significant. So those kind of stories that go back to our our lives, people in this room, and really being able to, to make those connections can be very powerful. Next, next question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, I work at Greenpeace Brazil, but from the D.C. area. Um, and I've been, I mean, in in my work and also in, I mean, throughout this conference, we've been talking about this, uh, these, uh, this choice of economic development and, uh, you know, environmental conservation. And I think it, it all comes down to what you're saying about questioning that, like, do we think of the development model as inevitable? And I mean, right now we're all, you know, coming to this shared uh, epiphany that it's, it it can't be inevitable. Um, and so I'm wondering, and you were mentioning GDP, uh, Jessica, about how that's like this major indicator. Do you feel like you have any other space, any space as journalists to talk about other economic indicators that can gloss over the story about the economic model? Because as much as there's some people in the Amazon that are saying. You know, this this is our our only option, or they have the perceived lack of options. There's other people that are saying, you know, we've been ushering in this development model for 50 years, and uh, the primary uh, deforestation happening is coming from the large landowners, and beef is the number one uh, source of cita of reports of um, working conditions akin to slavery. So, like, it's not serving a lot of the people who you know. Um, whose poverty is supposed to be alleviated by now. So I'm just curious, when you're in the newsroom, when you're trying to you know, get this story by your, you know, your, um, your editors, uh, you know, if you're able to, like, to incorporate other indicators and tell a bit more of that story so that that choice, that inevitable choice, doesn't, you know, doesn't seem to you know, just go on and on. Right, I mean, I think <clears throat> definitely, um, I mean, it's it's so it's so difficult as a journalist nowadays, and I think this applies to Brazil and it applies to the rest of the world as well. I mean, um, I'm I'm sure most of you have heard that there's this British um, journalist Dom Phillips, who disappeared in the Amazon um, with uh, with a well-known Indi indigenous rights um, uh, expert. Um, Bruno, um, and he, uh, you know, getting to those areas and being sort of like the freedom of the press and being able to get to those areas helps journalists tell those stories, right? And so if, um, if those, if journalists are scared to get out there and really understand the you know and and bring back those stories to the rest of the world and tell 
the world about these alternative models and about these alternative ways of living and show how vitally it is important it is to um, save these uh, communities. Um, that conversation is, you know, it's, it's not there the way that we need it to be. Um, I myself have never done the kind of reporting that uh, Dom was doing. Um, a lot of journalists don't do the kind of, write about the Amazon without doing the kind of reporting that I am doing, right? And so, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's more important than ever to tell these stories from the perspective on the ground and tell the stories not from necessarily the loudest voice, like, you know, the loudest voices who are, you know, you, you can pick up and call them, but actually getting out there and seeing how they're living and how folks are living and how things operate deep in the Amazon. And so in that sense, I think that, you know, what happened this week in Brazil, what's happening, you know, the search and the, the government not doing anything to really find the journalists is, is a huge step backward. It's a it's a tragedy, you know, not just for the the the, the people who were lost and their families, but for the um, for the uh, for journalists in general, right? Absolutely. And for the world, right? Because you're not getting those stories, and those stories are just incredibly important. Thank you for that. Uh, um, sorry, just, we've got one minute okay. left. I'm just <laughs> just gonna let you go. Um, can we get one more? Squeeze one more question in, Brett. Uh, hi, I'm Brett. I'm a uh, Pulitzer grantee this year. I just wanted to know, um, a lot of us who are very informed, um, not just in this room, but just uh, your readership, are feeling fatigue about you know, climate reporting. And how do you, as, uh, as newsrooms, compel people to action without being accused of being not objective or you know, having, having a far left agenda or whatever um, from both people who you're trying to interview with, but also potential readers. I follow the science. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's abundantly clear that the scientists um, have, real, have one single message, and that is a message that, that we as reporters are reporting. Um, and I think that in many ways, actually, um, the past couple of years, um, more than that, really, um, five, six years, um, wildfires, just incredible floods, um, the extreme weather that we've all been experiencing that may be contributing to the fatigue, but it has also really, really contributed to a much sort of broader knowledge base about understanding what climate change is, what it looks like, how we're all experiencing it. Um, so I think both of those things have happened, and fatigue has come with that. Um, but I look back, um, and maybe you all can look back to, to climate coverage 10 years ago. It was a really different game. Um, and I think that despite the fatigue, um, I think what we all had in this room um, and, and, you know, that hundreds of thousands of our colleagues have done um, is, is really grow people's understanding of how the world is changing. Thank you, Hannah. Um, thank you, Brett, for that question. I think we're going to, we're right up against time here, so I think we're going to have to stop it there. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists uh, for being here today, presenting your insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone in the audience here uh, and online, and um, we hope you tune in to more panels tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Stay for the oh, and yep, yeah, stay for the reception coming up soon. <laughs>